I'm going to talk today about wild horses versus rangeland health, biology, ecology, and politics surrounding these majestic creatures. Throughout the U.S. right now, this is a pretty contentious topic, and some of the things that I'm going to present are, might not be very popular among some groups, so I'm going to do my best at presenting the facts, the science behind it, try to keep my commentary eh, to a minimum, <laughs> and, and as it says down there, those are whatever I talk about here today are my views, not the views of my employer. Horses. I grew up with horses. I love horses. I grew up riding horses. We had horses in our backyard. When we'd be eating breakfast, these horses would come and eat breakfast with us. They were pets. They were like dogs, and we'd ride them. And, and throughout my daughter's life, she's had the opportunity to, to also uh, be around horses and, and ride horses and and just be surrounded with these animals. We really appreciate them, we like them, we like to see them out there, and even wild horses. So this is in the North Dakota Badlands, and just look at her face. Like, <laughs> it says it all. These really are amazing creatures. But I am a rangeland ecologist. I'm an ecologist, I really like ecosystems. I study ecosystems and try to maintain healthy ecosystems. And a, it seems like that, that right now we're at a point where people are having to choose whether we choose healthy ecosystems or wild horses and burros. We're, we're in a weird position right now, and, and I'm going to try to present some of the facts that reflect what we're seeing with the, with the horse population increase and the effects that population increase is having on a natural ecosystems throughout the U.S., mostly in the inner mountain west. A big part of the issue is where did horses come from? And that has been part of the debate. So horses native or non-native? Just as a show of hands, who thinks horses are native to North America? No one? So everyone thinks that horses come from outside of North America. OK, you don't. So one person. Well, horses did originate in North America. So the, the horse as we know it today, the genus Equus, was originated in North America about four million years ago. And about three million years ago, these horses started migrating through Bering Strait. So you'll see here, this is Alaska, Yukon Territory, this is Russia, and this is the Bering Land Bridge that connected North America with Asia. So those two were connected. About three million years ago, these horses started migrating towards Asia and parts of Russia. And between those three million years ago and now, there were several extinctions, mass extinctions of these horses here in North America. The last of these extinctions happened about uh, 13,000 years ago. Uh, it corresponds with Pleistocene, uh, 13,000 to 11,000 years ago. So that was the last extinction of horses in North America. And from there, there were no horses here till about uh, 1493, when Columbus brought him back to North America. First reintroduction of these horses back to, to the Americas happened in near the Virgin Islands or in the Virgin Islands. And then in 1519, these horses got brought to the mainland to what is today Mexico. And then from there, it started radiating throughout the Northern Great Plains and throughout the Great Plains. These stray horses that were called Mustangs between the 1600s and 1800s really started to overpopulate many parts of the Great Plains. And the, the, some of the herds uh, just numbered in the thousands. So there were a lot of horses roaming around back then. And, and in some places, even cowboys and, and different people started rounding these horses up and, and using them for different purposes. So just as a pause there, this image is a wet plate taken by, by Shane Balkowitz, uh, my friend who, who uh, owns the Nostalgic Glass wet plate studio here in Bismarck. And he graciously lent me many of his pictures of his wet plates uh, to, or scans of his wet plates to, to use in this presentation. And also Tom Wirtz, who's a photographer here in town, he uh, uses more modern methods than chain, and he also gave me some of his images to, to use in the presentation. So if anything, I hope you really enjoy those images because they are really amazing, and I'm really uh, grateful to them for having lent me those pictures. So does it matter where these horses came from? Some people say it does, some people says it doesn't, and there's a lot of debate whether the horses that went extinct 13,000 years ago were the same ones that Columbus brought back. But the paleontological record pretty much shows that they were the same horses. 
and the horses we see today roaming through parts of the western United States are the same horses that were here uh, 13,000 years ago. Uh, so whether you call them reintroduced or rewilded or feral, like whatever you want to call them, these horses were part of these ecosystems. And, and a lot of it has to do with just those time scales and how you view these time scales and, and trying to determine what is native, what is not native. And, and we see that with plants a lot too. Uh, so uh, if we placed a native uh, title under this horse, that would probably open up a lot of opportunities for management, which right now there are not. So that, that, that is one interesting thing about the biology of these horses and why there's so much uh, a contention about whether they're native or not. Because if they are, if, if someone decides, yes, let's check the box, they're native, then it puts them in a, in a whole different management category than what they are right now. It would put them closer to wildlife. And in parallel to, to what we see what I just talked about in, in terms of those time scales, the Prowalski horse, which we have some here at the Dakota Sioux, if you haven't seen them, they're pretty cool animals, suggest you go look at them. Those are what people think of as like the, the like a native prehistoric horse. And those horses actually went extinct in their native ranges in the, about a century ago, early 1900s. And then they only existed in zoos and places where they were uh, being conserved. And once they had a, a good enough population of these animals, then they started reintroducing them back into the wild in the 1990s. So this horse that we do consider wild did go extinct in the wild, got pretty much domesticated kind of through zoos and then put back in the wild. So how is that different from these horses that we're talking about here? So again, a lot of it is in the semantics and how if people talk about these things, and, and that's sometimes where a lot of that contention comes from. Horses in the Badlands, so bringing things a little bit closer to home. The horses have been in the Badlands since about the 1800s. Horses range, they're pretty much 56 to 60 inches high and about 800 pounds, so they're a medium-sized horse, breed of horse. And they truly are amazing creatures. If you've seen them, like, they're just amazing. And when you, if, if you haven't had a chance to go see these in the Badlands, go drive around, you're very likely to see them. So they've been around since about the 1800s in that region. And when Theodore Roosevelt was ranching in that area in the 1880s, he actually made a comment on there, which I'm gonna read out. So, in a great many, indeed in most localities, there are wild horses to be found which, although invariably domestic descent, of domestic descent, being either themselves runways from some ranch or Indian outfit or else claiming such for their sires and dams, yet are quite as wild as the antelope on whose domain they have intruded. So they have been here for a while. And when the park got established in, in 1947, they were there. And shortly after that, uh, maybe five, six years after the park got established, they actually rounded up a lot of these horses and, and, and cattle that were loose. And, and some of them actually eluded capture and the, that those are believed to be, or the horses we see there today are believed to be descendant for, from those horses that eluded capture. It, it's very interesting how they manage these horses in the park and it's very different from horses and horse management in the Western US because they are uh, uh, like a historic uh, demonstration kind of, uh, set up instead of wild and free roaming horses. So they are managed differently and, and you can actually go to their website, it's on there, and you can just Google it to wild horses in Theodore Roosevelt National Park and see how they manage them and, and, and some of the things that actually happen, the day-to-day -day activities of these horses. And I was talking to Dr. Karen Ryberg earlier and, and she mentioned uh, some people who actually track these horses and, and how, how just the, the ecosystem dynamics of, of how these things work and the amount of death that they actually experience and, and how these populations vary with, with the actual ecosystem. So it's not all as pretty as we imagine it and would like it to be. So throughout the broader Great Plains, so now going from North Dakota to, uh, to the broader Great Plains, these animals were instrumental in settling most of, of Western North America. And they were also used by, by uh, Native Americans, Great Plains Native Americans, uh, to hunt and for war and for many different things. So uh, they, they really were instrumental to, to 
to settlement and, and what we see today. So once they started uh, becoming those larger herds here in the Northern Great Plains or throughout the Great Plains, they started competing for resources with livestock, with cattle. So uh, in the early, probably 1600s, uh, actually 1800s to about 1900s, early 1900s, uh, cattlemen were really opposed to these horses and actually started rounding them up and, and just trying to get rid of them because they saw them as a nuisance. So that was until about 1950, 1960, and then uh, there was rising concerns about what was happening to these horses because they were seeing a lot of population declines. And that uh, kind of led to the 1971 enactment of the uh, Wild Free Roaming Horses and Borough Act. Uh, so that was enacted in 1971, and it provides protection to these free roaming horses on burrows, and it considers them a natural part of these ecosystems, an integral natural part of these ecosystems. Three, uh, seven years after this got enacted, uh, they realized that, that uh, there was an issue and that populations were increasing, and the, the there was a second act, the Public Lands Conser uh, Preservation Act, that allowed the Secretary of Interior to reduce populations in areas where they had actually gone beyond a manageable population. So the, the, it, there was actual authorization to reduce populations in these overpopulated areas. But again, due to controversy politics surrounding these issues, uh, the, the BLM, who was the one, the, the agency in charge of, of enacting this, uh, has not really been able to do as much as they, I think they need to, uh, or they think they need to. And uh, meanwhile, the horse population continues to increase. So when this act was set into law, there were about 25,000 wild horses on burrows. In, in, in the landscape controlled by, by the Bureau of Land Management. The estimate was that it could hold about 27,000 and still maintain ecosystem health and maintain healthy wildlife and, and everyone could coexist. Everyone would be happy if we had about 27,000. Any guesses about how many they had in 2018, just last year? 81,000, or eight, almost 82,000, sorry. So that's a little over three times the carrying capacity of these areas. That is a lot of horses. So imagine having one St. Bernard running around your house. Now imagine three. <laughs> now imagine six. Adoptions of horses have been going down since about 1995. Meanwhile, populations keep increasing. And uh, they, uh, scientists have estimated that population nearly doubles every four or five years. So really, do imagine those six St. Bernard's running around your house and you feeding him and watering him and everything that they would need. So it's, it is a lot of animals on top of what uh, the carrying capacity of what these areas is. So as part of, of the management that BLM can do right now, one of the things they do is they, they gather a lot of these horses out in the wild to try to bring down that, that almost 82,000 number. They gather them and they put them up for adoption. Each one of these horses that gets put into adoption, if you average it out, it costs about $1,000 to maintain each one of these horses in off-range facilities. But when we're talking about 46,000 horses, that adds up to about $49 million every year that comes out of those budgets. I've seen estimates of, I believe it was like $1 billion over the next 20 years. That's what it would pretty much amount to. So it is a lot of money and, and about two thirds, and it makes up, uh, up about two thirds of the budget of BLM for managing these horses. So two thirds of their budget just goes just to maintaining these horses in off range facilities. The other third goes to trying to keep the population out in the wild in thousands and thousands of acres, uh, keep it under control. So it, it, it is a big problem and it continues to be a big problem. This problem right now is pretty much centered in the Intermountain West, parts of Nevada, Northern California, 
some Utah, Wyoming. That area has experienced a pretty bad drought for the past 15 years. So anywhere from abnormally dry to exceptionally dry at, at different times throughout the, the last 13, 15 years. So when you think about what I was talking about earlier of having about three times the carrying capacity of these horses combined with 15 years of drought, imagine what that can do to an ecosystem. So I love horses, again, but I also love ecosystems. And I think, as humans, we depend more on ecosystems in general than many of these horses. What does over overpopulation cause? When you have these many horses, combined with all the other animals that are out there, you have drought, so there's less grass growing. There's going to be competition for resources. These animals are going to go hungry. These animals are going to go thirsty. There's going to be plant community composition changes. There is an increase in bare area that gives way for, for invasive species to come in, a species that they don't want in this part of the country, like cheatgrass. And as these horses start roaming around looking for food and water, they start going into areas, more populated areas, and, and where they really shouldn't be. They start going into private property and start having issues with vehicle collisions on highways. A big issue, too, and, and it's an issue that, that I guess doesn't get brought up as, as often, I think, is the impact that these horses cause on wildlife. Not, not necessarily the horses, but the, the overpopulation of horses. So when you have so many horses, if you work with horses or if you have horses, you know that they can be pretty dominant and they can start bossing other horses around and bossing your dogs and if you're not careful, they'll start bossing you around. So they do the same thing with wildlife. So there's actually data that shows that in many watering areas, some wildlife like bighorn sheep won't approach these watering areas when there's wild horses there because the wild horses just kind of push him out. So it's actually having effects in, 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 in animal patterns and how these animals behave. And many of these animals that they're affecting are actually threatened and endangered animals. So that brings a whole different eh, kind of worms, I, I think, into, into this. And, and so again, overpopulation causes competition for food and water, loss of habitat. So, I myself have not actually worked with these wild horses, but I have a lot of colleagues who do work with these horses and collect data on these horses. One of them is Amanda Gearhart. She did some work here in the North Dakota grasslands for a while and then became the Bureau of Land Management Wild Horse and Burrow Specialist. She's out of Northern California and she gives talks about these animals pretty often, so she was grateful enough to give me some more of her slides so that I could present here to you. So on her first slide, this is a slide that she uses as the first part of the presentation. She told me that in that area, that spring where that horse is at, has lost six feet of soil. So six feet of soil, that is a lot of soil. And most of it, they can actually attribute to horses. Why can they attribute to horses? They have the data. They have game cameras set in a lot of these springs, and they've been collecting data here for many years now. Uh, the, the graph there shows alteration of, of habitat. I'm not sure exactly how they, they develop those metrics for alteration, but I know what alteration means. So, so, so you can see that these areas, so where, where zero is no alteration, five is most alteration. And we see that these areas have been pretty severely altered and they have the pictures to prove what caused a lot of this alteration. Then when we look at, at some vegetation indices, they did height and they also looked at distance between different plants. So vegetation height is a lot lower in, in a lot of these areas that are frequented by, by the horses. Uh, so lower height combined with drought and everything I've been talking about, it starts changing plant community composition. And then you start getting large areas in between these the different piece, parts of vegetation, which means you're getting larger bare gaps. So when you have larger bare gaps, your susceptibility to erosion, wind and water erosion increases, and that's how you start losing all of that soil. So all of these things are connected. Again, this is part of this whole ecosystem, and I don't like to use the word balance. It's too kind of Disney, but there is this kind of balance. There's like a, a 
dynamic balance, I should say, like things like an ebb and flow of, of how things work. And, and right now it seems like it's not kind of ebbing and flowing. There's just this continuous overpopulation and we keep seeing continuous degradation of, of these lands. And we're gonna get to a point where eh, there's gonna be serious issue with starvation and thirst of these animals. So I, that's not a solution either. So in terms of on-range management of these horses and what BLM is actually doing to, to reduce these populations, they do gathering and removal. They have different fertility control treatments that they're trying out. But as you can imagine on, on the vast areas that they're working with, trying to capture horses and administer uh, fertility control measures or even permanent sterilization is not cheap either. And remember that they only have one third of their budget to do all of that because the other two thirds goes towards those off range facilities. So it's not an easy task and, and I guess they're trying as best they can with what they have. Currently, they have about 21 research projects working on trying to figure out best ways of, in terms of fertility control to kind of manage those populations. And they have been working with a lot of partners to try to get homes for these horses once they're off range so that then the burden is not on BLM to kind of keep these horses in off-range facilities, but actually people can adopt them. And there's some really neat videos online, videos about horse adoption and how good horses these are and great trail horses and why you should adopt these. So if you have time, I just check out some of those videos. They're, they're really neat and it's neat to see what, what they're doing with working with these horses. So right now there's 35 off-range pastures that provide space for a lot of the unadopted or unsold horses. Off-range management tools include different types of corrals, short-term corrals, long-term pastures, and then there's some public, uh, privately run sanctuaries. But one thing that I want to highlight is this. So a lot of these lease pastures are typically in the Midwest. Remember that map I showed at the beginning that this was a problem in the Intermountain West? It seems like the problem is starting to shift a little bit towards a different part of the U.S. now. So many of these horses get transplanted from the west and get put in the Great Plains. Yes, there's a lot of forage here right now, but what point is that really a solution versus just expanding the problem and moving it east? At some point, if we start getting hit by drought and we have these vast population of horses, what's keeping these ecosystems to start shifting towards a more deteriorated state, which has happened in the past, 1930s, Dust Bowl, so it can happen. As I was doing some research, looking at, at putting things together for this presentation, I ran into this. So just a little over a week ago, this came out where they're actually seeking bids for contractors to move horses from Western public lands to these different parts of the country, including North Dakota, South Dakota, 200 to 500 heads of wild horses. So great, they're trying to reduce the populations out West, but at what point is that really a solution again? So. I leave that question, I, I'm not gonna eh, tell you what I think, but I think you know what I think. <laughs> um, so uh, that, so it, it is an issue. And one issue that I see is that once these horses get moved out here to your neighbor's place, what's keeping those horses from jumping those fences and becoming feral horses and just do what they did out west and do what they do well? So it just cause for concern. And if you think about all the controversy that's gone on with these horses and, and the management of these horses, it, it really is an issue. So again, there's been a lot of controversy in terms of the management of the horses. A lot of people are against the BLM and Forest Service, different agencies' management of these horses. They are opposed to the gathering of the horses and removing them from the range. But then again, we, we need to try to balance healthy ecosystems and healthy horse populations. So without getting too political, I think, I think we have an issue where, where we're having to choose sides. And it really isn't about having to choose sides. We can actually do both if we, if we try to work together and do it well. So uh, we shouldn't have to pick horses or ecosystems. They can coexist and they can coexist in healthy ecosystems. So uh, a year ago, doctor, or two years ago now, uh, Dr. Barry Perriman, professor of rangeland ecology in, in, in University of Nevada, Reno, 
published this op-ed where he talks about course management right now being a crisis. And we really need to do something because it's affecting habitats and a lot of the animals and, and wildlife that depend on these habitats. And it was interesting, the, the pushback that this had. And it's, it's been pretty controversial. But I'll leave it at that for now and kind of mention how I got to be here giving this talk. So in 2017, I was invited to do a project in Kazakhstan. This project was about looking at land degradation, land vulnerability. They're facing a lot of climate-induced changes in their ecosystems. And they were looking at some of what we've done here in the U.S. with national resource inventories and rangeland health to kind of inform what they're doing there. They have a really great group of scientists there, but they, 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 they just need to kind of adopt a system that works towards management. Their, their science is more focused on pure science, not so much in, in applied science, applied on the land science, which is a lot of what I do and what we do uh, as rangeland ecologists. So I uh, got invited to go there and, and, and gave some presentations. I was in the Kazakh National Agrarian University talking to all these government employees and the uh, plan was to go again last year and do some actual field work because they really liked the project. We were gonna go and, and actually implement all this work on the ground. And at that time, I was invited to give this talk about courses in Kazakhstan, but then my trip got canceled. So I was on the hook to give a talk about horses in Kazakhstan. <laughs> so faced with that dilemma, uh, I, I decided to give a talk on, on what I do know about ecosystems here in the U.S. and, and my background in ecology and, and the issues that we see with horses. And, but I also wanted to go back and, and see how much I could talk about the, 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 the actual horses in Kazakhstan. So I contacted all my colleagues with, with, with which I, I am working with in, in this project in Kazakhstan and asked them about horses in Kazakhstan. And, and my first question was, hey, uh, what do you know about wild horses in Kazakhstan? I, I know you have Perwalski horses. And so uh, where do they roam and how do they get managed? And the first thing that he said was, we don't have any wild horses. Every single horse here is owned by someone. So even whatever Prowalski horses are out in the landscape, he claims are owned by someone, probably owned by the government, but horses are owned by people and very much treated like livestock. So if you can tell from this picture, there's actually a herder right there and these are not cows, these are horses. <laughs> so they, they very much treat them like livestock and they move them around. And I went to a local supermarket and I was a little shocked at first because you're walking around the aisle and I ran into these and I don't know Russian. In Kazakhstan, they still use Russian, but I can only imagine what these are made out of. <laughs> Just a wild guess. That was quite shocking at first. I was like, wow, it's interesting. But then I got to go to a local restaurant and, and that was even more shocking because that was the fancy thing. Like they invited us to these really nice restaurants and this was the dish that everyone said you have to have, like that's their best dish there. And this was at a German restaurant and that's a steak. And this was at a, a traditional Kazakh restaurant and those are four different types of, of preserved meats like sausages that are made with horse meat. So. That was an interesting experience, and as it says there, it's when in Rome, do what the Romans do, I guess. <laughs> and at first, I thought I was gonna have issues with this, just because, again, I love horses, I grew up with horses. But after the first try, I was like, interesting. <laughs> it, it tasted very much like beef, and, and I told the people there, if you give this piece of meat to someone in the US, they won't know the difference, probably. I couldn't, but then again, who am I to grade uh, beef and horses? So with that, I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to this talk, those who invited me to, to give this talk, the Visiting Scientist Series, the North Dakota Heritage Center and State Museum, Eric Hall in particular, Shane Balkowitz and Tom Wirtz, who provided many of the images or most of the images that you saw here today, hey, Amanda Gearhart, Barry Perriman, and Marat Bexultan, who actually provided content towards the slides and some of the data that I presented.